All right, so we're in chapter 10. Chapter 10. Good. All right. Let's go ahead and read down through here and see what we can find, huh? You guys curious about what we're going to find tonight? How many of you read ahead? Oh, we got one guy over here that did. Good Bible student over there. All right, let's get in it. Chapter 10, verse 1. So it happened after that, after this, that the king of the people of Ammon died. And Hanan, his son, reigned in his place. And David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent by the hand of his servants to comfort him concerning his father. And David's servants came into the land of the people of Ammon. And the prince of the people of Ammon said to Hanan, their lord, do you think that David really honors your father because he has sent comforters to you? Has David not rather sent his servants to you to search the city, to spy it out, to overthrow it? Therefore, Hanan took David's servants. <laughs> this is tough. And shaved off half their beard and cut off their garments in the middle at their buttocks. <laughs> and sent them away. And when they told David, uh, he sent to meet them because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, wait at Jericho until your beards have grown and then return. Now, when the people of Ammon saw that they had made themselves repulsive to David, the people of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, and from the king of Maaka, 1,000 men, and from Ishtab, 12,000 men. Now when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the army of the mighty men. And the people of Ammon came out and put themselves in battle array at the entrance of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah, Beth Rehob, Ishtab, and Mechab, Maaka, were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the battle line was against him before and behind, he chose some of Israel's best and put them in battle array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he put under the command of Abashai, his brother, that he might set them in battle array against the people of Ammon. And then he said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the people of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. So be of good courage. Let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. So Joab and the people who were with him drew near for the battle against the Syrians. And they fled before him. When the people of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fleeing, they also fled before Abishai and entered the city. So Joab returned from the people of Ammon and went to Jerusalem. Now when the Syrians saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they gathered together. And Hadadezer sent and brought out the Syrians who were beyond the river. And they came to Helam, and Shobach, the commander of Hadazizer's army, went before them. And when it was told David, he gathered all of Israel and crossed over Jordan and came to Helam. The Syrians set themselves in battle array against David and fought with him. And then the Syrians fled before Israel, and David killed 700 charioteers and 40,000 horsemen of the Syrians and struck Shobach, the commander of their army, who died there. And when all the kings, who were servants of Hadadezer, saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians were afraid to help the people of Ammon anymore. So, interesting little chapter we have here. Uh, kind of crazy, though, uh, when, when you see how this all came down. 
You ever, you ever have like a desire to do something really nice for somebody? Maybe you know they're hurting and, and you want to maybe come alongside and maybe be a comfort to them or encourage them. Or maybe they're struggling financially. You want to give them a financial gift or, you know, uh, with a pure heart. You don't have any motives attached to it. You just want to be helpful, right? And so you step out to be helpful and what do they do? Well, they think you're conspiring against them or you're trying to trap them or they interpret it very negative, right? This is what we see happening here with David. Now, the last chapter that we were in, we we talked about Saul's son and how David uh, showed mercy to him, how he spent the rest of his life in the house of David and sat at meat with him and he was well cared for, all because David wanted to show mercy, all because David wanted to keep his promise to Jonathan. Now, Jonathan's dead. So does Jonathan know whether or not David's going to keep his promise or not? Does Jonathan even care? Probably not. He's dead. So we see David doing this honorable thing to Mephibosheth and uh, scooping him up, so to speak, and bringing him in under his own roof, showing mercy. Now, the people of Ammon had aided David in the past. The king of Ammon uh, had uh, worked with David. They had allied with him and showed kindness to them. And, And now the guy dies and his son takes his place. When you see um, when you see authorities change hands, you know, we see that in our country a lot, right? Because we have these elections and a uh, president isn't a president for life, thank God, right? <clears throat> and we get the opportunity to get rid of them and get new guys in there, you know. And I think maybe every now and then, maybe you're thinking, well, we had a pretty good president. He was doing real good by us and everything. You know, everything was going well. We're we're pretty happy. And then uh, his time is up. And here comes this other guy who moves in. And boy, it seems like he's just out to get us. It seems like he's got a whole different heart than the other guy before him. Well, just think what it would be like if you had to deal with that bad guy for 50 years while he was still reigning all those years, how did it affect the people of Ammon, the new king? How did his attitude, his suspicion, um, and his fears about David affect his whole people group? So Hanan, now his son, is reigning in his place. There should be a time of mourning. There should be a time of grieving a time of sadness when we lose a loved one. And, and you would think that the whole nation would be in mourning over their king's passing. You know, if we were to lose a president uh, somehow during his office and he would die, you know, the whole country. Well, we saw that happen with John Kennedy, right? I'll never forget that when I was very young and 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 that happened and how, you know, people were crying and, and I was just taken back by that. Uh, the whole nation was mourning. So they don't really tell us in our, in our text here how the people of Ammon responded to the new king. But we got a glimpse here that this new king doesn't have the same heart that his father had. We got a glimpse here that this new king is afraid of David and suspicious of David. And so he doesn't trust David's motive here. Now, what he does when David sends this consort of people, if you will, uh, to go to the people of Ammon, to the king, Hanan, um, to comfort them, he sent a delegation from, from himself, from Israel to them, representatives of David. And uh, what do they do? <laughs> the princes of the people. Check that out. That's important in verse 3. It's the princes of the people of Ammon who said to him, 
and they plant the seed of suspicion, right? Whenever you have a, a group of people uh, and someone has put, someone is in authority over them, so to speak, uh, and the people trust in, in that leader, um, and someone comes along and they start whispering in the background. Well, did you know that, you know, he's really, he's, you know, scraping off the top or he's having an affair or he's doing this and that. And, you know, he has bad plans for us and we need to be uh, suspicious. And they start planting seeds of doubt. Now, this very same thing that we see here, it happens today. It happens in government. And it happens, sadly enough, it happens in the church. Uh, Paul talked about it even way back when he was writing his letters, how men creep into the church and they come in as though maybe they're called by God to be there and they begin whispering and talking about whoever might be like maybe talking about Timothy. Timothy was a pastor. They might be running around, you know, Timothy's just a young guy, he's inexperienced, he's not disciplined, whatever they might say, but they're planting seeds of doubt into the people's ears. Once people start listening to that, it's infectious. It spreads. It spreads like a disease. Um, we saw it happen here. Uh Amazingly enough, those who you would lean on as support or uh, people who have your back or whatever, and because of the whispering and the doubt that's planted into people's minds concerning their leader, so to speak, then they begin to turn. They begin to lose the vision. They begin to be disgruntled. You know, we see it over and over with Moses and the children of Israel. And you got that real big word in there. They murmured against Moses. They were talking trash about him behind his back. Um, where does all that come from? What spirit is that that brings that into a group of people that erodes the authority of the people that God has put there, but yet the other people are murmuring, and it can destroy a whole kingdom. It can destroy a whole church. It can destroy a country. And so the tactic of Satan, and I'll say that, I believe it's a tactic of Satan, it hasn't changed much. It's still the same today as it was back here. The idea of causing suspicion with murmuring behind people's backs about them. Um, does anybody have the courage to come up and say, hey, uh, Bob, I've been hearing some stuff that's very troubling about you. Uh, maybe you could enlighten me. Do people do that? No, they don't. They should. As a matter of fact, I would say that to you, okay? You should. You should hold me accountable. You should hold our leaders accountable. If something's going on, then you should be able to say, love them enough to come to them and say, I'm hearing something that's very disturbing. Maybe you can help me out a little bit and clarify this. That would put an end to a process that starts to unfold that once it gets to a certain point, you can't stop it. It's too late. Once you lose people's confidence, it's too late. So that would be my thing tonight. I would say, oh my gosh, if that happens, you know, and you have that going on, please come to me. Don't be afraid. I won't strangle you. I don't know why it's so hard for people to be honest with other people. But it's so important, I think. And I know I'm kind of getting off on a little bit of a, a tangent here. But what I'm seeing going on right here with these princes or these people who are supposed to have the king's back. They're supposed to be there to build him up and encourage him, but 
Instead, they're really sabotaging him. They're changing his heart towards David and, and the children of Israel. So they plant suspicion in the king's mind. He's not coming to comfort you. He wants your stuff. He wants your people. He, he's going to come and spy on us and find out our weak spots. And then when we least expect it, he's going to pounce on us. And so David sends this group of men, probably, you know, uh, I would think humble men, to go to the king here and say, hey, David sends his regards. If we can do anything to help you during this hard time, we want to be there for you. Doesn't that all sound really good? You know, I would want to hear that from people. You know, you're struggling. We want to be there for you. We want, and then you turn around and you say, oh, no, no, you got a different motive. Someone's planted that in my mind that you got a different motive. And these aren't just run-of-the-mill people who are planting these doubts. It's the princes. It's the ones that people look up to as leaders. And so the leaders now are starting to talk trash. And the king believes it. And what does he do? He takes David's servants. Now, how humiliating, you know? Shaves off half their beards, cuts the bottom out of their britches so their butts show. Yeah, and sends them down the road. Well, my goodness, they were so ashamed that they wouldn't even go back to the king. And, you know, Haman took David's servants, shaved off half their beard. That's something we would do when we were... I think probably this way. Oh, sorry about that. Forgot I had that thing there. Um, so, you, I don't know. Did you play pranks on people when you were younger? Maybe you still do. But you know the old prank where you take shaving cream and you, you know, put it in somebody's hand or whatever, and then you tickle them and they take their hand and they spread shaving cream all over their face when they're sleeping or, you know, shave off half their mustache or one of their eyebrows, you know, while they're sleeping. Um, practical jokers, you know. Well, that was, that's a practical joke and it's probably not very nice. But what these guys are doing here is on a whole nother level. The, the, the actual act isn't much different than the prankster would do. But the humiliation that it brings to these men, you know, their beards, they were proud of their beard. They grew them for a long time. It takes a while to get that baby where you want it to be, you know. And, uh, and to have them cut half of it off, obviously they probably had to go back and cut the other half off to start the process all over again. But they, they, they come back and they're telling David, you know, we went to meet them. Uh, they wouldn't come home. They're, they're too ashamed uh, because of what Hanan has done to them. And so Dave says, I understand your struggle. Uh, stay in Jericho. Let your stuff grow back. Fix your pants. Once you get them all fixed up, you come back, right? Well, David's not real happy here. David, now he's very angry. David, I think we've learned as we've been going through these books, David has a temper. And when he gets mad, you don't want to be in proximity of him because his wrath is great. So when David heard about it, he talks to Joab and he says, hey, get the guys together. We're going to go avenge uh, these men that were humiliated. Evidently... <clears throat> The people of Ammon weren't very tough. Maybe they were small in number compared to Israel. But when the king of Ammon finds out that David, Joab's coming uh, to avenge these men, he goes to the Syrians for help. Now he's going to make a treaty with this other people group and bring them in and say, hey, David's coming, he's going to take us out, 
If you come and help us, we'll, you know, give you a tribute. We'll make a treaty with you. We'll do whatever it takes so that we can have your strength on our side. Very normal uh, strategy back then to pay off other armies to fight for you. Very typical thing that happened. So we've got the Syrians here from Zobah and Rehob and Ishtab and Maaka and uh, they're all out there in the field and Joab sees it and he chose his best men and went after them. And the rest of the people were under the command of Abishai, his brother. So you got these two brothers, they're commanders of uh, David's, David's army. So you got two groups. You probably got the people of Ammon coming down one side. You got the people of the Syrians coming down the other side. And Israel's down here. And so they split up into two armies. And the deal is, if the Syrians start beating us down, then you bring your guys over and come and help me. If I see that happen to you, then we'll bring our guys over and we'll help you so they don't discourage, uh, destroy you. And I'll come and I'll help you. So it's interesting in verse 12, <clears throat> Joab says, be of good courage and let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. We've seen over and over again when someone took it upon themselves to say, I'm going to go into battle. I'm going to go fight this army. Uh, and I'm not going to ask God about it. I'm not going to pray about it. I'm just going to, by instinct, I'm just going to go. And then what happens usually? They get their rear end kicked, right? They lose bad. So sometimes we see David inquiring of the Lord. Sometimes he doesn't. Saul had a problem with that when, when Saul was in charge. He often forgot to ask God what he might want them to do. And, and he would uh, respond, you know, as a, a man in the flesh would. And uh, so... It looks to me like Joab here has got some spiritual insight to asking for God's blessing as they go to battle. And sure enough, um, when the people of Ammon saw that the Syrians were running away, um, they must not have paid him enough, right? Maybe they didn't offer him enough treasure. Maybe the motive for them fighting for Ammon wasn't enough. And they just decided, forget it. And they turn on him. And they run away. And they kind of abandon them. And so they see the Syrians running away in verse 13. And they start running away too. So now you got two armies running away from Joab and his brother. And uh, they take off and they entered the city. So Joab leaves and from the people of Ammon and went back to Jerusalem. So now these guys are regrouping and they're saying, you know, they, they were going to destroy us. We got to regroup. We're going to try it again. In verse 15, the Syrians saw that they had been defeated by Israel. They gathered together again. And Hadadezer brings out the Syrians who were beyond the river. Must have been another group, another army that they called out from beyond the river there. And they came to Helam. And uh, Shobach, the commander of Hadadezer's army, went before them. I would imagine that Joab's home now. He's back in Jerusalem. He probably thinks it's all good. But David finds out, he gathers all of Israel, crosses over the Jordan, and came to Helam. Now, I think it's interesting that we find them crossing over Jordan. Because the first time they crossed over Jordan, 
was when they were entering the promised land. And the idea was, you're going to enter into Canaan, and that's where you're going to be. You're not going to need to go back over Jordan again. But then we see several times throughout um, these stories that they do. They cross back over into the land that they came from in order to do battle with their enemies. I don't know uh, why they would want to do that. Maybe they felt like we need to take care of them while they're on the other side of the river so they're not a threat to us. But they cross over nevertheless. And uh, uh, David, again, goes after him. And the Syrians, in verse uh, 17, set themselves in battle array against David and fought with him. I guess I get a little confused because we read in here how, you know, how many guys can there be? David kills 20,000 foot soldiers in the Syrian army. And then three verses later, here comes the Syrian army again. Where are they getting all these people from? You know, it's pretty amazing. There's a lot of them. The enemy just doesn't seem to want to surrender. The enemy's always got people in reserve to attack. He's always got people in reserve to attack you and to attack me. Sadly enough, this is a battle that you and I will fight until we're in the Lord's presence. We're always going to be fighting against our adversary's armies. Um, you know, Paul talks about that when he says that uh, we're not fighting flesh and blood. You're, you're, you're not fighting against men. You're fighting against spiritual powers in high places. These aren't weak powers. These are very powerful um, influences, spirits, demons, however you want to put it. And they're on all the levels of that heavenly realm there that we do battle in as Christians. It seems as though we get a victory and two verses later in our lives, here it comes again, maybe in just a different form. But nevertheless, we're under attack again. You ever wonder about that? You know, you would think, well, I won that victory and I'll never have to deal with that again. Right? It's just not true. It is not true. So when I'm seeing this kind of stuff, I'm trying to break away from the obvious. And I'm trying to see us in the picture here and say, how do we, how, do, how does our lives relate to the idea that the enemy just seems to keep on coming? I had a great victory yesterday, but now today I'm, once again, I'm getting beat down and I feel like I'm defeated and I thought I won this battle. We're fighting against principalities and powers. So principalities organized demonic influences, powers, the power of the evil one, spiritual darkness in high places. These aren't skinny little weak demons that we're doing battle with. These are very powerful demonic forces that as Christians, we do battle with. Sometimes on a more subtle level than sometimes on a much more direct attack that we might get. But here's the thing. Paul, in his letter to us, telling us that you need to realize that it's not your boss. It's not your wife. It's not your kids. It's the enemy. It's the adversary. It's the devil that is coming against you with his armies. It's the devil that's bringing these Syrians into our life, so to speak, over and over again. All of David's life, we're going to find out as we go through here, all of David's life, he was a man of war. And you would think that after a while, David would become weary of the battle. 
You ever get weary of the battle yourself? You ever get worn down and discouraged and just feel like you're not strong enough to to make it through that once again? Um, on the positive side of that, okay, yeah, they keep coming. But we also see over and over and over again that David gathered his people together too. David's not alone. He has an army. David has strength in his army. And so do we. We have strength. We, we have weapons of warfare that we use as Christians. One of them is this, which is really, really important that we have that, right? Right? It really bothers me when people come and they say, oh, yeah, boy, I'll tell you the devil, he was really bugging me today. But, you know, I just put my foot on his neck and told him, you know, you can't touch me. And I've been wrestling with demons all day long, you know, kind of a thing. And I told him to get out of my house and this and that. You know what? Can I just say this to you? We have no business addressing them. I hate that when people do that. It just bugs the heck out of me. They don't have any power. We don't have power to, to drive them off. Only God has that power. That's what we have to lean on is his power. And when you saw Jesus out in the wilderness, Jesus was being tempted out in the wilderness. He didn't negotiate with the devil. He didn't tell him, don't you know who I am? You can't come around here picking on me. He didn't do any of that. How did he do battle with Satan in the wilderness? Right there. He used God's word to defeat his adversary every single time. He, he quoted God's word. And it tells us that after three episodes of that, that the devil left him. Until a more opportune time. But he did come back. Um, but he was using God's word. So we have the sword of the spirit. Which is the word of God. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Right? And it's the only thing that we have. That's really able to address the spiritual battle. That we find ourselves in. That's why it's important that you know your Bible. That's why it's important that you're able to hear the Holy Spirit bring into your remembrance the word. So you can do battle the same way Jesus did. When people tell me they yell at the devil or they, they do this and they do that. I think it's in Jude where, where Jude says, Michael did, did war with Satan and he wouldn't even bring an accus accusation against him. He didn't stand there and say, I'm going to stomp on your neck because I'm a great angel. He said, no. He said, the Lord rebuke you. And when, when people today find a demon under every rock, so to speak, you know, you got the demon of bad breath or, you know, gluttony or, or whatever it is. There's a demon under every rock. And, and we're just going around turning rocks over and, you know, no, we don't do that. That's, that's, not, that's not what we see happening in Scripture. We lean on the resources that God's already provided for us to do our warfare with our Syrians, with our Philistines, because they keep coming. It seems like there's an endless number of them. And you know what? One day when Jesus comes back, just from his glory of his return, it'll wipe them all out. He's not going to be arm wrestling with them. He's not going to be dueling with swords. Just his glory is going to destroy them. And it'll be over. But until that day comes, there's an vast amount of them that just seem to keep coming over the hill after us to weaken you 
to neutralize you, to discourage you. And so David gathers all of Israel again in verse 17, crosses over Jordan, comes to Helam, and the Syrians set themselves in battle array against David and fought with him. And once again, the Syrians fled before Israel. You see that over and over. There's not many times, unless perhaps David or the commander did not pray, seek God before they went in to battle, then, then we find Israel running from their enemy. But every time God blesses their efforts, the enemy runs away from them. Every time. And I think that we have the same authority in Christ. We have the same, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. That's, that's our bodyguard, so to speak. He's the one who does battle on our behalf. So the Syrians in verse 18, they're running away again. And 40,000 people David kills of the Syrians. Yeah, 20 in this battle, 40 in this battle. How many of these guys are there, right? They just pff, being fruitful and multiplying, I guess. But David struck them down. The chariots, 40,000 horsemen. And he struck Shobach, the commander of the army, who died there. He defeated his demons that day, so to speak. He defeated the, the adversary that was coming down. And what was this all about in the first place? It was all about a false accusation, wasn't it? It was all about a lie that the princes had told uh, the king to plant that seed of doubt. And look what winds up happening. Thousands and thousands of people die because of this little tiny, it seems not that important event. And so it's an, it's an amazing thing how, oh, it's somebody might say, oh, it's just a little thing, you know, don't worry about it. It's, it's, it's just a little thing. Well, that little thing can grow. That little thing can, it can multiply. It, it you know, uh, we, yeah, we want to nip it in the bud. You know what I'm saying? We want to get it while it's small. And, I, you know, I've used this illustration millions of times about, you know, and it's coming up, spring's coming up, and here comes the weeds, right? And the ground's nice and soft, and then weeds come out by the root really easy. And God says, you better get out there in your planter bed and get them weeds out of there. Because if you wait too long, the weeds are going to get too deep. The ground's going to dry up. And you try to pull them. And what happens? Well, the root stays in the ground and, you know, it grows back. Got to nip it in the bud. You got to get it while the soil's soft. We can't wait on these little insignificant things in our lives to become big problems down the road. On a physical level, emotional level, spiritual level, I think it applies across the board that the Lord is saying, tend your garden. You know, I got this little message that I like to do once in a while. How does your garden grow? Right? And that's exactly what it talks about. It talks about like, you know, the parable of the sower. Remember that? When Jesus goes out and he's throwing all, all these seeds out. And some are landing on the rocks. And some are landing in the pathway. Some are getting choked out by the weeds. And a very, very small percentage of them, only one quarter of them, takes root. It's really not a good harvest when you think about it, right? You throw all these seeds out there and only one fourth of them takes root. And then you find out as the parable comes to a close that some of them only yield 10, some 40, some 60, some 100% fruit. So not every seed that gets root and starts to grow brings back fruit. So when you start looking at that, you think, okay, one-fourth of the seeds that are planted 
take root. Now the thing's got to grow and it's got to be nurtured and, that, and it's got to bear fruit. So out of that, one fourth of those bear fruit, 100% fruit. So when we're doing God's work and we're seeing these small little victories in our life, it's okay. It's all right. It's not time to panic and say, oh my gosh, I put all this effort into it and I'm only getting this tiny little harvest out of it. Well, you know, Jesus kind of warned us about that. I think for me, going into ministry, that was really a big lesson that I needed to learn. Because God was telling me over and over again, don't worry about that. You go and teach the word. Leave the results to me, will you? Let me grow the church. It's not about the number that, that you have every day or the number of people that show. It's about being faithful to what God's called you to do. And then you leave the fruit bearing up to him. Right? And if you don't, you know, if you don't, then you start coming up with all these, um, you know, tricks to try to get people, you know. We're going to have a carnival out in the parking lot for, you know, you know, uh, we're going to do this. We're, you know, you try to start forcing it to happen. Uh, and people do that all the time. But again, getting back to our spiritual battle, getting back to our life as Christians. Um, yeah, we're going to chase the enemy off over and over and over again. But here's the thing. Sometimes... I put myself in a position where I give the enemy an opportunity. I'm compromising maybe with this or that, and I've opened the door now to be attacked. To see how many of our brothers and sisters live their lives under condemnation of failure, the number's huge. There are so many defeated Christians walking around because they're condemned because they keep failing. Well, that's not God's plan for us. We keep failing because we take our eyes off God. We keep failing because we don't remember the simple principles that God's given us to live by. To cling. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the vine and you're the branch. We need to be plugged into him because he's our source of strength. Pastor Chuck used to say, Jesus is divine and we are the branch, right? I love that because our fruit comes from being plugged into the branch, to the plant, the vine rather. And when you see the vines out here in Oregon, you know, they're on strings and the grapevines spread out over the summer and bear fruit and they go harvest it. And then in the fall, they go in and they hack it all up to where there's only two little sticks left, right? Sticking out of that, that grapevine. But that vine needs support, doesn't it? If you were to just let it grow on the ground, it would get trampled and it would rot and it would burn and it wouldn't bear fruit. A vine... We have one over there on the wall. A vine needs support. So what do we do? Well, we put up trellises so that our vine flowers can grow and have something to hang on to. Well, that's kind of how we need to be too. We need that support. We need that pillar that we can wrap ourselves around so that we don't fall to the ground and rot. Just simple principles that, that we can use in our lives to help us have victory, even though this battle is going to go over and over again. Hopefully, prayerfully, we get to a place in our lives where we say, oh yeah, I remember how I messed up last time. I'm going to use a different strategy this time, right? And this time I'm going to have victory. Because I'm going to be clinging 
to that support. I'm going to be plugged in to the source. I'm going to, I'm going to have God's word to fight for me. And so in our world today, you and I are surrounded by our enemy. They're there. Can they influence us? Well, if we're not plugged in, absolutely. They can influence us. You know, I've had people come here and, you know, they'll come in and I'll go up to say hello to them or something like that. And I can smell alcohol. And I can tell by their demeanor that they're feeling very guilty and condemned because they know that you could smell the alcohol in their breath and now they're defeated and they leave and they go home feeling real crummy and they just continue to dig that pit deeper and deeper and deeper until you don't see them anymore because they're not plugged into the source. You know, they're not replacing that thing. That thing is the the Syrian in their life. That thing is the Philistine in their life that wants to come and, and to destroy them. And we see it all the time with people who struggle. Um, and there's a lot of ways to struggle as Christians. Uh, a lot of us struggle with things that, that uh, you can't see. You know, you might have something against somebody in here or in the church or something. And you got really bitter feelings. And, but you can come in all smiley and everything. And you can put on a good front but your heart's really hard and really cold towards them. And what does that do? Well, that just destroys you in the end, doesn't it? I used to have a friend that worked with me and we'd be on the highway and, and uh, you know, we get in traffic jams and you got all those geniuses out there driving vehicles around and, you know, and old Jack, boy, he would just go off. And this guy's loud anyway, you know, He's just a loud person, but he would go off in the truck next to me, yelling at the top of his lungs at these people. And I'm sitting there looking at him. I'm saying, Jack, they can't hear a word you're saying, dude. You're killing yourself here. You know, well, that's kind of how it is when we harbor junk too. It winds up taking us out. It turns on us. And, and, not, and not only that, Jack, but you're driving me nuts too. You know, I think you got to get a horn that says idiot or something like that. <laughs> Stupid, you know, uh, blow them off the road or something. But, but, you know, it's futile is what I'm trying to say. In the end, those things that we, that God wants us to have victory over, they can take you down. They can make you bitter, angry. And I believe that God, no matter how many times them Syrians come over the hill, no matter how many times they retreat, then they keep coming back. I think God wants to use those battles in our lives to make us stronger. Um, I think it's first, second Corinthians, maybe first chapter where Paul says that God is the God of all comfort. It might be first Corinthians who comforts us in all of our trials. God's comfort comforts me in my difficulties so that when I encounter somebody else that's going through those difficulties, I can comfort them with the same comfort with which God comforted me. Now, I could never do that unless I had experienced some hurt. Or maybe some defeat here and there. But I could never do that unless I have experienced that comfort from God myself. So sometimes, you know, when we go through tough times, it's not just to make us stronger. It's because God wants to use it in our lives to help someone else. Someone else who may be struggling with substance abuse or... Uh, you know, pornography or whatever it might be. You know, that big P word that nobody likes to say. That's a problem. So, 
Uh, we're going to park it right there, you guys. So um, next week, we're going to talk about Bathsheba. I've been kind of saving this chapter. I didn't want to get into it tonight. I wanted to save it for next week. Um, but let's go away from this tonight and say, hey, you know what? No matter how many times that enemy comes at me, I have the resources I need to win. I have the tools I need to have victory in my life. But I got to want it. I got a hunger for it. I need to pursue it like that pearl of great price that Jesus talked about. A man found out there was a pearl of great price in a field, and so he went and sold everything he had so that he could buy the field so that he could go and get this pearl of great price. Well, that's what we do. We sell out to Jesus. We sell everything we have so we can buy that field with that pearl, and we go and we seek it out. So you got to want it. You got to have a hunger for it. Um, and I think that's where people get a little bit discouraged sometimes because we want everything so automatic. I want it to be drive through, right? I don't want to have to prepare it and wait for it and work for it. I just want to drive through and just say, supersize my order and, you know, move on. And I want to live my Christian life like that. Well, we can't. We can't grow. That's right. So uh, let's leave tonight thinking, I got everything I need to win. And yes, I may stumble and fall, but that's okay because I'm going to get back up again. I'm going to brush myself off and I'm going to keep fighting. And I'm going to grow and I'm going to get experience in the spiritual warfare. And I'm going to really become quite good at winning these battles as time goes by, right? That's what we call spiritual maturity when we're growing in the spirit and, and we become people that can help out the ones that are struggling really, really bad. So let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Father, I want to thank you for your word tonight. And I know that, Father, as we read these stories and we read about these attacks and David and all, uh, sometimes it's a little bit difficult, Lord, to find out how that applies to me um, when I read it. But I'm just thankful that uh, we're able to, to mine out uh, the gold that we find in these stories. And, and, and this evening, Lord, we've learned that, yes, the enemy might keep coming, but you've given us the tools to win the battle. You've given us the tools that we'll never need to retreat. You've given us weapons. You've, you've given us uh, the armor of God that we can put on every morning before we leave home so that we might be prepared for when them Syrians come over the hill in our day. Uh, so thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that you've given us everything we need to live godly lives and help us to see clearly, God, what your plan is and to be faithful to the things you've called us to do. And we thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.